Hey, everybody. Welcome. Uh, my name is Tarian Webb, and I am the 10th director of the Center for the Church and the Black Experience here at Garrett Evangelical, and I also teach race and religion on the theology faculty here. We are so excited, thrilled for you to have joined us, be able to join us for this last formal event uh, of the CBE calendar year, a conversation uh, with the one and only Dr. Carrie Day of Princeton Theological Seminary, as she discusses one of her recent uh, books, a brilliant text, Notes of a Native Daughter Testifying in Theological Education. We are doubly excited that this event is co-sponsored by the Center for Ecological Regeneration here at Garrett, uh, as we um, right now actually commemorate and celebrate the launch of the center, as well as the installation of uh, of my friend, of our friend, of our brother, our colleague, Dr. Tim Eberhardt, into the McLean Endowed Chair in Ecological Theology. Congratulations, Tim. Uh, and a very, very warm welcome to all of those who are joining us virtually, and also those joining us in person as a part of today's festivities. So as a, as a brief word of, of housekeeping, uh, you all, Dr. Day and I will be in conversation for about uh, 40, 45 minutes or, or so, and we'll try to leave about 10 minutes at the end for her to engage any questions uh, that might come up during our time together from the audience. If you if you have them, if you do have questions, please do feel free to drop them into uh, the, the Q&A feature here, and uh, Dr. Day and I will both be able to, to see them. I'm not going to say a whole lot in the way of introduction so that we can make best use of our remaining time uh, together, but I, I will say that Dr. Carrie Day is Associate Professor of Constructive Theology and African American Religion at Princeton Theological Seminary, um, and, and she, she's not going to want me to say this part, uh, but I, I mean it wholeheartedly. She is one of the uh, indomitable scholars of our day. Uh, with the type of uh, depth and intellectual dexterity and, and grace that leaves her, uh, in my estimation, just without peer. So, Carrie, we're so glad to have you here today. Thank uh, so you. With, Thank with, you. With, with, that, with that said, uh, Dr. Day, tell us a little bit about, uh, about yourself and how you came into this project. Um, what is this project and what motivated you to write it? Yeah, so first, Torian, thank you um, for the opportunity to be with uh, the community, the seminary, um, with the uh, um, uh, center as well, uh, Black Church Experience. Um, and uh, it's just been a joy. I've been looking forward to being able to yeah. be in discussion uh, with you and then with the larger yeah. community um, on this particular book. So Notes of a Native Daughter, um, I often like to begin by saying it was not a book that I thought I would write now. Um, at this stage in my career, I thought that sort of uh, later uh, into uh, the stage of my career um, that I would write a book like this, reflecting on the transformations and theological education and offering some kind of vision uh, in terms of a way forward. Um, but I am a part uh, of a community of which uh, Ted Smith is a part of that community. He's actually the principal that uh, brought 11 other illustrious scholars together that also have written books for this series, Theological Education Between the Times. I think right now, uh, Willie Jennings' book, uh, After Whiteness, is one that has yeah. been read um, um, uh, by a number of seminaries and divinity schools around the nation. Um, but he came to me. Um, and he said, you know, Kara, we have this series. I was already involved in some of the conversations about how we should think about transformations in theological education. And he mm -hmm. asked me, would you be willing as one of the 12 scholars to write a book? And, you know, in the beginning, I, I remember thinking, um, uh, it wasn't that uh, uh, in some ways I was dismissing anything that I could say about mm -hmm. uh, the state of theological education. But my first reaction was, what? could I say that's new? Because mm -hmm. there are a number of Black scholars that I admire very deeply who have written extensively <laughs> about yeah. 
the problems of theological education about not just uh, forms of structural racism, but intersectionality in mm -hmm. relationship to structural racism within theological education, attempting to cast visions. And so in the beginning, I was sort of hesitant. I was reticent about um, at this stage in my career, um, writing. And then as I began thinking and mulling it over, what I realized is two things. The first thing um, is that, uh, I am a black religionist and uh, yes. I do bring to the table a commitment to thinking about uh, both constructive theology and ethics, but it is also the case that I stand or I'm situated within the Pentecostal tradition. Right, right. right. And so with that being said, it, 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 you know, it, I really begin thinking about what, what is a distinctive, right? perspective that I bring, not only as a Black woman scholar, not only as a Black feminist woman scholar, but as right. someone that has been deeply shaped by my own Pentecostal tradition. And not only that, what does that mean against the current transformations or shifts that are underway, such as Although we're seeing a decline in the overall numbers of people enrolling, particularly within mainline uh, denominational institutions, um, of people enrolling in ATS approved divinity schools and seminaries, um, the, the sort of uh, what is sort of ironic is that the fastest growing group of people that are coming into ATS approved divinity schools and seminaries happen to be people of color and who um, many sort of identify as either charismatic or Pentecostal, right? Yes. And so right. what does it mean to not only speak as a Black woman about intersectional forms of structural race, racism within the context of theological education, which is structured in white dominance, but what does it mean as well now to think about what progressive, what I refer to as progressive Pentecostalism, what Pentecostalism adds to that conversation? Um, what are the ways in which uh, progressive Pentecostalism is not only sort of something that in some ways there's no doubt has been shaped within the context of theological education, meaning there have been mm -hmm. Pentecostals that have gone to seminaries and divinity schools and out of their learning, so to speak, have gone back to their communities to think critically. But what are the ways in which now progressive Pentecostalism can shape the logics, practices, and future direction of theological education as a whole, right? Mm -hmm. And to me, that that was right. enough for me to say, um, I need to rethink this and, 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 write, and write this book um, because I do have something to say, not only as a Black woman, but as a progressive Pentecostal scholar on the unique ways in which intersectional forms of structural racism are felt within the academy. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I, I love that. One one of the things that we can kind of so th this is this is something of a of a method question, right? Um, of sorts. So one one thing that immediately st stuck out to me in um, in the title of your text before even digging into it, you know, some I'm, I'm a you know we're many of us many many black religionists, you know, we're also we're we're students of black letters. Right and, and black literature. You're so so. I'm obviously hearing Richard Wright here, but but I'm I'm thinking about Baldwin, right? You know, in in, in this in this notes tradition, right? Um, and and it's interesting, you know, to to think about, um, you know, so so for for the, for those kind of in in the in the conversation who might not necessarily be be as familiar, um, you know. Native son, you know, a, a, a classic Richard Wright text, and and the ways in which bald ones kind of notes of a native son kind of you know speak speak to that uh when i saw your title yep. I'm, I'm immediately kind of back in into that that baldwinian tradition and and thinking about the ways in which a number of i think black religionists are are a few making a move in their writing in our writing to in addition to like the the scholarly monographs also step into a different type of writing, right? I'm, I'm thinking about Ishan's you know, lonely letters here, right? But the, the, the question is, um, when, I, when I think how kind of Baldwin deploys this language of notes in his corpus a little bit more broadly, I, I always get this sense of like, I'm trying to, I'm, I'm trying to help y'all. I'm trying to tell you something here. Like I'm, I'm, I'm trying to, right? The, the, the letter that he wrote to, to his nephew, my dungeon check, I'm, I'm trying to, to help 
you see something, that's right. Um, and immediately, not only after reading your title, immediately just kind of jumping in, into your, your text as you situate us in this, in this black religious kind of experiential tradition of, of, of testifying, testimony service, I distinctly got a sense of like, no, I can, we, we can write in a way that holds theological institutions accountable while at the same time, because of our love for these spaces, we're also trying to help you see something, right? Was that, was that a part of your process at all? It, it was, it was. I'm so happy you brought up the title because um, Notes of a Native Daughter turns sort of and draws on Baldwin's Notes of a Native Son in two ways. That's, uh, I think, germane. It's related to precisely what you bring up um, about this question of the way in which writing as both form and content uh, it, it, that is black within black letters. And yeah. what I'm trying to reflect as well, in some ways attempts to foreground a different epistemological starting point from yes. much of um, um, uh, what we see within white literature, within say white theology or within, you know, white fiction or whatever. So there are two, there are two ways that I draw upon a bald one. The first is Notes of a Native Son. And I don't want to assume that people are deeply familiar with yeah, Baldwin's yeah. Notes of a Native Son. I mean, here you have in Notes of a Native Son where Baldwin is offering a narrative on what it means to be Black in mm -hmm. America, um, but be Black in, in America from within a paradox, right? Uh, and, mm -hmm. and to me, the paradox is named in the, the, the phrase native son. How right. could it be that within a country that, uh, that uh, uh, begins with the exploitation and the brutality of black flesh, of black yeah. life, right? Um, that Baldwin would claim for himself the, the words of native son. And so in notes of a native son, yeah. at least for Baldwin, it is to communicate that in some ways, America has been, uh, that, that he's experienced himself as both stranger and kin, right? right? As both insider and outsider. I mean, Baldwin has always maintained this sense, not only in notes of a native son, but throughout his corpus, that um, in part, America is what it is precisely because of Black intellect, because of, 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 of Black expressions of beauty and joy and, and mm -hmm. so forth. So to, to talk about the American experiment is to always and already talk about the ways in which Black people, their, you know, the, 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 the strength of their character, their, their intellectual production, their artistic and cultural production have, have sort of contributed to who and what. Um, yes. America is, but simultaneously, of, of in, in that sense, shaping who and what America is, although he's critiquing America, right. left and white, we, uh, left and right, we experience ourselves, he experienced himself as an outsider, right? Yes. As as even though there is a sense of uh, that America is only America because of, of, of Black agency and Black action, that simultaneously we are barred, right? We are silenced, we are written out of these historical narratives. And so what I was trying to do is capture in some ways that liminal yeah. sort of paradoxical space that Baldwin is talking about and talking about notes of a native daughter that in the yeah. same way, I my sense is that black, not just black women and black queer people, but I would say black folks more broadly experience themselves as insiders, mm. as outs and outsiders within mm -hmm. theological education, within religious mm -hmm. studies more broadly, as kin yet stranger. I mean, That's right. you know, what would, what would theological education be yeah. without Cone, without Cannon, Katie Cannon, as right. I write about, without these different kinds of figures? So we know that theological education is what it is precisely because of these Black voices, but yet there's this liminal space. So that's the first thing that I was trying to capture. Yeah. Um, so, so, so that theological education uh, is both a site of harm and home. And how yes. do we wrestle with that within, yes. the, within, the, within the matrices of structural uh, racial mm -hmm. oppression, right? But mm -hmm. then secondly, the way in which I'm drawing off of Baldwin is to say, 
precisely in the category of notes, right? I say at right. the beginning of my book, I'm not trying to offer a right. kind of right. philosophical uh, argumentation um, right. on, on, on experiences as such, but I'm wanting to offer testimony as mm. a, a kind of, a, of category, um, an epistemological category, a category that produces a different kind of knowledge about divinity, about where divine presence is, about which bodies, mediate divine presence mm -hmm. in, this, in this sense in my community black bodies who many who were illiterate that could not mm -hmm. read or could barely read that um um that in some ways uh it, you know uh move through life as uh perhaps janitors or, or domestics from much of their lives many of them were migrants from the south yes. up to the north um, during the Great Migration at the beginning of the 20th century. Um, these are the folks that, the, the, the elders, the mothers that I grew up with in Springfield, Illinois. And so what does it mean? These people seen as disposable That's within right. uh, the eyes of, a, of white American society and even within theological education, the ways that they're talked mm -hmm. about historically, what does it mean to now think about divine presence being mediated in and through them, right? Yeah. And what kind of knowledge do we learn about the world, about ourselves, about, about God's presence in the world, in and mm -hmm. through these people? And so for me, Notes of a Native Daughter, it's, it's not just about this liminal space that I'm working out about what it means to be Black within the right. context of theological education, but what mm -hmm. does it mean to speak about knowledge and how mm -hmm. we should think about theological education as such? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. No, I, I love, I love this. I love this point about kind of trying to carve out different sorts of epistemological spaces. And I'm, and I'm thinking, you know, part, part of me ha, has my, uh, my administrator hat on, right? And, and thinking about the ways. I mean, this is part and parcel with the text, right? But, but part, part of what I'm holding here is, um, and looking and thinking internal to the Garrett community, mm. right? And, and the language that we give, the, the missional language. Right, and trying to live into, in terms of our commitments to the doing of public ministry and public theology. Right, one one thing that that I've really tried to wrestle through and, and pull push and pull through during my time here, and I know this is also important to, to Dr. Eberhardt, who's been a, been an important conversation partner here, is how to um, functionalize this work of of creating different sorts of knowledge productions, and and for for some of us myself included, our, our turn has, has been to, uh, to the creative, right? to the creative cultural uh, expression, performance, dance, right? Um, writing, the visual, visual arts, mm -hmm. um, pre precisely because of the ways in which these different iterations, the different expressions, right, of, uh, of culture, of humanity, many of us believe, I believe, can help us tap into something uh, you, unique, unique mm -hmm. about God's salvific interest in the in the world, in the earth, right? Mm -hmm. I'm I'm thinking about this alongside your your calling us back to this idea of testifying, mm -hmm. right? You know, as as a and I'm I'm thinking about it as a type of kind of creative cultural practice, a type of knowledge production. I'm, I'm an old school Baptist boy, you know? So when, when, when you talk about testimony services, taking up the whole, the whole time, like I, I have these memories, right? Yes. Being, like why, they just keep talking, right? Yes. Um, but, but latching on specifically to your point about truth telling, right? Testifying as a type of truth telling. What does that mean when we think about bringing these conversations of, of testifying and truth telling yeah. into our spaces of theological education, where black and brown bodies are, are always already necessarily yeah. in precisely more precarious positions, right? Yeah. What, yeah. what does truth telling mean and look like for us? What ought it look like? Yeah, that's a great question, right? So, you know, for me, when I think of how I wrote about testimony or testifying in my book in relationship to truth telling, um, one of the things that I think is it would be then important to emphasize in um, uh, the act of testimony, if I could for a moment, I don't want to assume people understand yes. what, what I sure, mean sure, sure. when I'm speaking about 
um, testimony service. I mean, I write about it in my book for those that maybe didn't have opportunity to read that first chapter that it's really uh, this uh, a tradition that has sat within Black Pentecostal churches, but it's been more broadly within Black churches. Right where there is a time in the service, normally uh, near the beginning of the service, where in a sort of call and response format, people are invited to stand up where they are and to sort of speak about things that have happened to them in the week, but speaking about those things with reference to what God has done for them, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so they might testify then to having a hard time at work or not being able to pay particular bills, but how through the grace of God or through the strength of God or God uh, um, uh, providing something for them that they didn't need, they were able to experience, right? God's deliverance or liberation or joy or whatever it is, okay? Mm -hmm. and so. The reason why I'm, I'm, I'm sort of descriptively explaining this is because within the testimony service, what is of great importance to me is just not the content of what's being told, but implications for how we think of the subject and subjectivity. Mm. So within testimony right. service, it is never simply the solitary person, right? It is always the collective. Right. Um, and it is actually the collective in some ways, even though the individual is getting up and speaking, it is the collective ultimately that draws the speaker into voice, right? Mm. It's through my testifying and them saying, amen, that's right. God is good. This call and resp response format that, that and this happened uh, quite a bit, that the testifier in the middle of testifying about something might receive a new revelation of their own experience yeah, yeah, yeah. through the affirmation of the community, which yeah. could result in all kinds of things. It could result in shouting in and dance, anything. And in so, real time. Yeah. Right? right. So then turning back to what is the right. relationship between testimony, again, as a kind of epistemology, as mm -hmm. a form of knowledge and its relationship to truth telling, what it suggests to me first is that Testimony is not invested sort of in the Cartesian subject, I think, therefore I am, where you have the solitary subject, subject or individual that is sort of the site where knowledge is produced, right? I, I sort of, I think mm -hmm. my way in, say to a knowledge proposition or, or right. to something about the world, but rather right. testimony service um, uh, emphasizes, notes the intersubjective character of knowledge itself, right? That, that in other words, part of my own subjectivity, how I'm produced as a subject is actually through intersubjective experiences and encounters through the experiences with and for others, right? This is what we learn in sort of phenomenological language, right? With and for others. And so it's in the collective that in some ways, my identity, my subjectivity, my agency, is brought into voice that how I come to understand the world around me and who I am. So what does that mean then for truth telling? I think in thinking about theological education, the question becomes, uh, and, and of course I'm, I, this would be a question to uh, 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 theological education structured in white dominance, primarily ran by uh, white folks, right? right? And that would be, um, can there be an acknowledgement and a leaning into this kind of intersubjective awareness of not only the state of theological education, but how we should be thinking about um, knowledge production, about what we can learn about what's going wrong right now with theological mm -hmm. education. I mean, for me it would be, because I'm in the area of constructive theology and ethics, for example, what's what, and I write about this, right? what's going wrong, say, with the field of theology, mm. right? Where, where it, it, it's just not about asking, can minoritized voices be included, say, into the theological canon, but yeah. precisely the production of certain forms of religious experience, can those experiences and articulations be counted as, 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 as theological, theologically That's proper, theological. right? Can it That's be counted right. as that, that which which is theological right mm -hmm. um that which is christian that which is mm -hmm. and so so for me you know the question of truth telling uh has everything to do with leaning into this intersubjective moment particularly uh white power structures people that represent and work for and with within the uh within structures of theological education white power mm -hmm. structures 
what it means to hear the truth, that we don't even know the truth. We don't, you know, many, many have, are not even conditioned to know the truth as such because there's not a space that's provided wherein there's an acknowledgement of this intersubjective sense that, mm. what, that, that the knowledge that we can even speak of about what is being experienced by way of intersectional forms of structural yes. racism, that this is in case happening. That's, yes. that, you know, for me, you get a lot of, you know, for example, scholars, I've heard this over and over, right? One scholar that asked me when I was applying fresh out of um, um, uh, my PhD program, well, you know, it seems like black women are now uh, uh, coming into a number of positions within theological education. Um, and that in some ways ordination is opening up for black women as well. And so how is womanist relevant to today's conversational theological education? That question right there, right? Conceals and hides even the truth claim that I'm trying to make yeah. about persisting intersectional forms yes, of yes, structural yes. racism right. among, but that, that, that the way it's framed doesn't even allow the possibility, right? Of mm -hmm. this question of the ways in which the persistence of structural racism still yes, deeply yes. affects black women, right? Yes, yes. So, th so this is my point about about right. that 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 part of truth telling, the ability to hear truth as such, is about opening up this space and thinking about how knowledge is produced, the intersubjective character of knowledge, which means there has to be a lot of deep listening to know yes. what is true. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I, I love that. And, and you, you, I feel like you jumped in my head and kind of anticipated uh, a, a next question. So I, I want to, I want to ask if you can kind of, uh, kind of explicate that that womanist strand in in the analysis a, a little a little bit more, right? So one one thing that's always that's really struck me as a um, as a as a modest student of uh, womanist literature is 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 kind of the, the, uh, the, the degree to which, you know, such, such uh, questions are raised that strike to the core of like the, 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 the functional and the practical mm -hmm. um, movement in, in ways that, that other literatures uh, have, have, have for me many times felt just a little bit too heady, right? You know, so I'm, I'm, I'm thinking about things like, and you, you, you struck a, a few of these chords, um, you know, in, in terms of like the the uh, the intersubjectivity, right? Uh, intersubjective awareness of of self and community. Uh, I talked about intersectionality. Um, but can can you can you highlight for us a, a little bit more, particularly for folks who might not necessarily be um, as as familiar with with the fem black feminist or womanist traditions? Like what 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 are the what are the ways in which kind of your, your particular frame as a womanist theologian kind of motivated the, the questions that you bring to the analysis? Yeah, that's, this, is a, this is a great way of, of, so it is a case that I'm a black woman, right? Um, um, and as such that I was really, really invested in this uh, uh, text and foregrounding black women as producers and purveyors of knowledge. And, and when I say yeah. Black women, I'm, I'm not only talking about the way in which I wrote about, for example, Katie Cannon, yeah. but the way I wrote about Zora Neale Hurston, the way I wrote about Lorraine Hansberry, right? The way I wrote about uh, uh, Yvette Flunder, all of these people that in some ways are uh, theological and cultural producers for me yes, right. um, about uh, uh, in terms of how Black women continue to contribute, <laughs> excuse me, con to mm -hmm. continue to contribute to um, how we should think about the world that we live in and to questions of justice. Um, but, but one of the things, and this was brought out in what I wrote about with Katie Cannon and her, um, I say seminal essay, Metalogues and Dialogues um, on the womanist idea where it is a case within black feminist and womanist traditions that it has been about foregrounding, right? Black women um, in, in the way that I just described. Um, um, but one of the things that I wanted to do in this book um, is not simply to speak about the work of womanist and Black feminist traditions as simply about the inclusion. Because the next question becomes, well, if it's about, say, a politics of inclusion, but inclusion into what, right? Uh, is, it, is it inclusion into the same models 
and frameworks that we have that work to undermine the agency right. and the very subjectivity that's built on kind of anti-Blackness itself, yes. that's built on the erasure of right. Black women as such. And so I was forced to really ask these questions. Of, I'm, you're going to be using the language of inclusion and belonging. The question, what inclusion and a what? And for me, that's why Cannon's essay on metalogues and dialogues became important, because what she wanted to communicate about the womanist idea. And I think that this stands as well for much of what black feminism has done from um, an intellectual or an, an epistemological standpoint. And that is when Katie Cannon talks about the womanist ideas, she, she essentially points to, when she says a metalogue, the way in which the dialogical nature of knowledge is what the womanist idea points to. Mm -hmm. And so what the womanist idea is, I mean, in some ways it is a, 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 um, it is a discourse about and for women, but it's also a gift to humanity as right, well right, as she right, says, right. Um, to think about the dialogical nature of knowledge. And so as she writes about this, she talks about, so it's, it's not just about um, uh, uh, simply about um, uh, thinking about racism or heteropatriarchy, that's part and parcel. But it's also asking what are the larger sort of intellectual frameworks, right? Mm -hmm. um, and what's the form of those frameworks? Are those frameworks, for example, absolutist in nature or do they function um, as either or sort of uh, 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 logics to where uh, from the very beginning, knowledge, and this goes back to what I was saying earlier, knowledge itself is seen as static, absolute. And, and the reason why this is an important point is because if you recall in chapter three of my book, I sort of say, well, Black theological education uh, might be something that people turn to as a way to escape the problems of racism within white theological education. But wait a minute. We have some right. of the same problems because what we find in Black theological education is literally right. the disenfranchisement of Black queer people and women, right? right? And so you have some of the same That's mimetic right. activity That's in right. terms of, 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 of structural racism going on. So right. this is Cannon's point is that, oh, what does it mean when, when turning to the form again of, um, uh, of, of theological knowledge of how we think about God and ourselves and the world to always ask, what is missing, right, in what we know about a phenomenon, of what we know about a thing or a person or a place or an idea, so that, so that the goal becomes within the knowledge production process to always have enough sort of flexibility and, and, and sort of a kind of inbuilt contingency yes. to, 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 to revise. <laughs> Oh, what what we what we say about the world, what we say, yeah. uh, and so so the point here for Katie Cannon is that that just doesn't apply to white discourses. That's right. That applies to black discourses. Yeah, this sense you, you see this sense yeah. of open endedness, this revisability that right. then can properly capture at any moment the new questions that are at being raised with right. that's right with reference to difference, otherness. Right and ultimately justice. And, and so for me, this womanist idea, this black feminist, I would extend it to, uh, mm -hmm. of, of the dialogical nature then of knowledge is what's so critically important what black feminist and, and womanist traditions have been trying to teach, not just say theological education, but Western traditions of knowledge right. more That's broadly right. for decades. Right. For decades, yeah, for decades. Absolutely, I, I, I love I love this, um, and I want to stay here for just a moment. I'm, I'm reminded by one of our doctoral, by one of our PhD students. Uh, I think a, a brilliant point he raises in, in the chat, uh, and I agree with this. I think that this question of um, kind of what are what are the motivations and, and, the, and the questions that, that kind of uh, drive our analysis, kind of specifically rooted in. Um, the Black feminist and Black womanist traditions, I think those, the, that orbit of questions is particularly germane to our Garrett context, right? our Garrett evangelical context, a number of different reasons. Um, I'm always thinking about, part, and, and part, part, of, part, of this, part of this is a pedagogical point for me, but part of it is also um, kind of uh, directing a center who's 
um, mission in a, in a significant way is kind of thinking with and through the daily lived experiences of kind of black folks broadly understood within the seminary community, right? So I'm always interested in, the, in these questions of, but what does this mean lived out in the lives of the most precarious among us, particularly, particularly in students of color, right? Um, and it, part of what, part of what concerns me about the moment that we're in kind of culturally, you know, so, you know, you have these, we have these cycles, right? These ebbs and flows where, you know, some major catastrophe of history happens and, and then, you know, questions are posed to these institutions. You need to better consider the experiences of, of X, Y, Z. Right? CB founded in the 70s happened in large measure because of this, precisely this point. I think we're in a similar moment. I'm, I'm really concerned with the ways in which, now I, I talked to some, uh, some artists in, in my in my orbit of, about this. What does it mean that it's 2022 and we have major corporations now? Now, now all of a sudden realizing that Black folk matter, right? Presumably, yeah. right? What what what, what, is, what is that doing to how we are kind of justice mobilizing and organizing? What does it mean when we have institutions? Our institutions <laughs> are learning. Theological institutions are not exempt here. I'm not thinking about anybody in particular. I'm talking about everybody. Right, theological institutions are not exempt here. What does it mean for how we move in in spaces? How how bodies, particularly student bodies, move in spaces to be in a cultural moment where a number of institutions are saying, "No, no, no, yeah, yeah, yeah," you know, yeah, the black stuff matters, right? Mm -hmm. So yeah. your, your your point about kind of a tradition always being primed to pose the new questions. Right, um, in ways that, that that do not presume that the questions of the previous generations are usable questions for our generation. Right? Right. What, what what does how, how how might the tradition instruct us yeah. in in the in these really kind of granular lived experiential type of ways in our institutions? Gosh, this is it's such a good question. In some ways, I try to get at what you're asking at least within the context of theological education, um, when I, and I believe this is in um, the second chapter, Learning to Pass, yeah. When, yeah. Uh, when I discuss um, that uh, there is no doubt historically, for example, that the womanist idea, um, uh, the, the womanist traditions that we see written about within theological education have been marginalized, right, within, yeah. say, theological production. But there's a kind of Janice faced nature to this, right? Mm. Um, this goes to the increasing corporatization yeah. of not just the university, but the corporatization of seminaries, of, di of divinity schools, where, um, for example, uh, you know, in a number of divinity schools and seminaries right now, there are these uh, major curricular requirements where it actually involves a kind of ethnicity or race requirement, right? To yeah. have a kind of fluency or to have a kind of competency in oh, racial justice. And so, yeah, yeah. Right. And so uh, as a result, um, there are these positions saying black liberation and womanist theology that are then um, created as a way to sort of fulfill the particular aspects that sit on the curriculum of, of a school. Yeah. But, and, and, and I use Monica Coleman's essay, Must I Be a Womanist, for example. But what happens when, um, and this is what, of course, Coleman raises in an article, what happens when you have Black women that are walking into the academy that in some ways, because of what is being demanded on the market and what is being demanded on the market is that Black women be womanist. I mean, Part of it is black black women and womanists in order to fulfill a quota, in order to fulfill a requirement related to the curricula, right? Yeah. That sort of um, uh, fits in to the overall, I would argue, sort of um, um, uh, sort of white liberal goals that are expressed Absolutely. within the institutional framework. But what Absolutely. does it mean when you have black women that are walking in that may not want to identify as yeah. womanists, who doesn't maybe consider their project? A womanist yeah. as such, maybe not even black feminist as such, maybe the sensibilities, but not right. wanting to be named as such, yeah. um, who then sort of come up against a roadblock, right, where, where in some ways, in this case, womanism uh, is a sort of being co-opted 
um, in the interest of white liberal theological education and its increasing corporatizing measures. Now, the issue is uh, within the academy, this goes on and say, wait a minute, womanism has a central place. Black, you know, African-Americans are being tenured uh, more than ever, <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. These are the arguments that are being made, right? Mm -hmm. Well, to me, and I think this is why it is so important when you talk about lived experiences and more specifically getting back to testimony as an epistemology, what are the experiences or what are people testifying to on the underside, on the underside. Right, of what is going on? And so you will have people, you know, narratives that will say, well, I was locked out of right. a position for years precisely because I didn't identify in this way as womanist, uh, a womanist. Mm -hmm. Or um, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. yes, uh, it wow. is the case that I took on a position, but we all know that like, it might be the case that we have these requirements, but when it comes to, for example, tenure and especially promotion of full professorship, yeah. the statistics are poor and lag behind right. incredibly within right. the context of theological education. Right. Um, and so, so for me, um, the reason why testimony and testifying is so critically important, it is to push against these narratives in some ways that have actually, that are that these narratives that claim or arguments that claim we are actually in a position uh, in terms of racial and ethnic diversity where the theological academy is better off than it's ever been. Mm. And this is precisely the narrative, right? That mm -hmm. I'm wanting to push against and mm -hmm. say, um, in real numbers, in terms of student enrollment, okay. But for example, what is the real lived reality in terms of when, say, Black students come, the cultural ethos, how they are accepted, right. if they're a, if they're forced to leave behind their own indigenous vocabularies and, and religious grammars for the sake of passing, as I talk about in the book, and not just with faculty. You know, yes, you have a number of black faculty that come in at the assistant level, but how do we talk about retention? And not just right. that, though the boards or committees that actually decide on tenure, what are the ways in which countless black women have been denied tenure because their projects do not comport or conform with yeah. what is considered canonical perspective? So all of these, you know, all, all of what I'm saying is so critically important to counter um, um, these issues that you're raising about the corporatization and, mm -hmm. and, 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 and some of these narratives of increasing success in terms of diversity within yeah. theological education that, that, that I'm saying no, but, but in order to yeah. get at why it's not successful, we need yeah. to hear. Yeah, but, yeah, yeah. Uh, among, among native daughters and, and sons, what's yes, going on? Yes, yeah. I mean, it, it's it's this it's this weird sort of exceptionalizing, right? You know, and and it, it it's it reminds me. Um, I don't know if it was Imani Perry, somebody, uh, some somebody at, at Princeton. Uh, it it might have been Imani. It might it could have been anybody. Uh, was kind of drawing my attention for the first time uh, about about six or seven years ago to like how the, this, how the, the, the tool of narratives that exceptionalize kind of how they function. What is the work that they're doing, right? What, what, is it, what does it mean that we in 08, 2010, what are the sorts of assumptions that we're making about black life and experience because we have a black president, right? And we could look at any number of exceptional figures, any number of exceptional figures. And, but, beyond just kind of being able to point to, you know, to Oprah, right? And to, to President Obama or, you know, yeah. to Jordan, right? Or, or any, any, any number of other characters, um, but beyond being able to kind of point to these folks and, and raise questions about, you know, really start to interrogate, is, is there such thing as a meritocracy? But be, beyond that work, I think the folks have been asking for a while, there's this, this whole other kind of um, tradition, right? To, to continue to be mined and uncovered in terms of thinking about not only is it the case that voice is kind of on the underside of, the, of this canon, 
exist, mm -hmm. but they but they exist in ways that that engage with and 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 shape and inform how we imagine the the exceptional. Right. Exactly. Right. So kind of pull pulling us into pulling us into this conversation, I think, is is just so so critical. Um, I want to be mindful of our time. We we have about fifteen minutes left. I, I want to make sure that. Um, if there are folks who have questions, have the opportunity to uh, to to ask them. Um, we're not having any come up come up as of yet. Um, so, uh, can, if there was, um, I, yeah, Michael, I saw you just dropped some, uh, Doctor Day. If there's something that, so if I don't get a chance to say it before this this webinar is over. I think notes is is I think it ought to be required reading. I don't know who's in the audience here. I think it ought to be required reading at every level of this institution. Uh, so if there's anybody here who can who can kind of help make that happen, um, yeah. I think it needs to happen. Uh, we, we have we have a we have a couple questions pop up. Uh, so I'm gonna I'm gonna go to, to some of these questions now but but Carrie before we leave I I, I do want to make time uh, for you to to answer the question, you know, what what would you leave us with if there was a takeaway, you know, yeah. or two from this text? What, what would you leave us with? So just kind of book, bookmark that. Um, we have a question, and this is an important question, kind of given uh, we talked about the the, the CER co sponsorship with, with the CBE of this event. What might this text uh, note, so or kind of any of the topics or themes that we've invoked during our time together, have to do uh, with with environment? Uh, sustainability, eco-womanism. Yeah. So, I mean, I think that um, in terms of my major argument about intersectional forms of structural racism, I try to be real clear in my text that um, in listening to Native daughters, um, in listening, even though I was focusing on Black women and Black queer folks, um, that the intersectionality piece, I think, opens up, right? Because intersectionality is about noting the various um, things, right? That you could say impinge upon right. conversations of structural racism. Um, um, that in environment, of course, would be incredibly important. I'm thinking here of Dr. Melanie Harris's major work on eco womanism, yeah, right? right. Um, and, um, and not only does she give this, I think just quite amazing history of how people of color have been central to environmental history, number one. <laughs> but then secondly, um, to think about uh, um, eco-womanism, what she refers to as eco-memories, right? Um, mm -hmm. To think about uh, not only the st story she tells about her ancestors and then other um, uh, figures that she's foregrounding, but within our own communities, to think about those persons in some ways that provide a sense of connecting environment to questions of structural. Yeah. Like I'm thinking here, you know, within my grandmother's neighborhood, uh, she had a neighbor three houses down that, you know, would had a garden and would grow food. And I mean, wow. what does it mean when people on that block oftentimes did not have enough money to buy groceries, right? That in some ways, this, I say community, it was her garden, but it was like a community garden community because garden, in many yeah. ways it yeah. fed, it, it, it allowed for subsistence. It fed so right. many people in the neighborhood, right? right. Um, and so for me, I mean, part of the question, again, going back to, to testimony, this category that I'm giving of how we come to know about God, about community, about ourselves, our, our duty to each other. Um, I think then that, that you know, the, the, the relationship or, you know, between environment, how environment intersects with questions of uh, structural racism is really, really important. And of course, I, I wanted to at least speak to my grandmother and I'm trying to remember, oh my gosh, it's, it's, I'm blanking three rows down who her neighbor was, um, Miss Johnson. <laughs> Miss oh. Johnson, yeah, Miss Sue yeah. Johnson. Um, um, just as an example, right, yeah. of, of, of then what we are called to as communities. And I'll say this one last thing about the environment, I don't write about this explicitly either, but I just gave a lecture maybe uh, in the pandemic about a year ago 
on um, taking my cue from James Cone's article, Whose Earth Is This Anyway? written in 2000, where he's making these connections, right, between racism and the environment, right? Um, in some ways, Harris is taking her cue, I think, from the question that Cohn is yeah. asking. And this is one of the things, and so uh, there was a conference that um, Princess Seminary did in 2017, actually on uh, precisely this question of race and invite in, in ecology that I was a part of. Mm -hmm. But then I lectured on uh, 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 taking my cue for, from Cone in making the argument that many seminaries really do need to think about investing um, not only in, say, taught courses that connect theology to the environment, to other intersectional forms of oppression, but at Princeton Theological Seminary, we have something called the Farminary where we have mm. invested in a site yep. where students can go and actively as a community with the broader city and other areas uh, around participate in what it means to ministerial and vocationally live into um, ecological and environmental justice, but making those connections yes. uh, with how that's connected, right, to structural racism, heteropatriarchy, and so forth. So, yeah. you know, my, my biggest thing would be to, um, you know, say to Garrett, um, what, what does it mean to think about, again, classroom participation, I'm not trying in any way dismiss that, but what does it also mean to think about collaborations um, that allow people to show up at sites and to participate hands-on in a communal way in making these connections? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, no, I, I love, I love that. Um, I want to jump back to another question that that was posed, kind of riffing off some of our, our earlier conversation. But I, I wanted to thank you for for naming, uh, for naming Mother Sue Johnson. You know, I think this this naming is is important. You know, yes. in, in the yes. space and and as you were reflecting, as you were answering the question, I, I mean, you you know this, and and some some others in our Garrett community know this. I do a lot of. My, my work and research and activism work in other parts of the world, particularly in the Middle East. And when I think about this question of um, not only agricultural self-sustainability, but more broadly, how we, how communities hold, how peoples hold these sorts of questions within community, mm. right? That uh, it, it is, that is not, you know, it's something that very deeply resonates with, with those with many of many of us kind of situated in, in Black U.S. tradition for the reasons that you highlighted, right? But it, and it is also part parts of these traditions that resonate. I'm finding in so many so many communities, particularly communities of color, people groups, ethnic people groups across across the globe, like holding holding these questions in community. Um, it, I think it's, it's such such a uh, an amazing phenomenon to uh to, to engage and be a part of uh, i wanted to to pivot here we had a, a question that, that popped up kind of going back uh leaning back on the the conversation of of womanism um we're curious about uh how testimony and testifying is heard in the places where uh where, where our womanist students and faculty go right outside yeah. of the the mm. The, the institutions of, of theological learning. How do you see womanism mm. and testimony continuing to have increasing impact in these non-academic spaces, churches, oh. hospitals, schools? Um, I love this line, wherever the daughters go. Yes. Right. How how do they take what our mothers have spoken uh, yeah. into, into their our ears? Can you speak to yeah. that a bit? And you know, so this is why when I was describing uh, Dr. Cannon's, yeah. I think, Im important groundbreaking analysis of the womanist idea, not, I mean, it, again, it, it is about how Black women are producers and purveyors of knowledge and how they experience the world. But then more broadly, Cannon is wanting to make an intervention to speak of womanism as an idea that makes an epistemic intervention, right, yeah. into the form of knowledge which helps us get at the content of knowledge, right? Um, mm -hmm. And so with that being said, um, then the way I see that taking up residence is, you know, these women may not be uh, self-identifying 
<laughs> you know, right. or even I would say black queer folks self-identifying right. as womanist or right. saying I'm doing womanist work, right? Right. But if we take seriously what Dr. Cannon has laid out as a sort of this larger dialogical character related to, to knowledge, what we can know about the world, which mm. allows us to stay open to every new to every new question that emerges so that we can sort of recalibrate and, yeah. and, 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 and know sort of the resources that we need to use in order to meaningfully engage a particular question. Mm. Um, mm -hmm. That I can say yeah. that the yeah. womanist yeah. spirit, the womanist idea is going on, for example, through the work um, and I just absolutely adore the work that say Bishop Yvette Flunder is doing in the Fellowship for Affirming Ministries, where this yes. has been uh, yes. for so long, yes. for decades, it was a marginal denomination and reformation mm. that no one really had heard about. Yeah. And now it's coming to the center more and more. But this is the work of the work. a Black woman, a Black yes. Pentecostal woman, for that matter. Yes. Or we, we talk about the social movements that have been operating over the last decade, right? I mean, Black Lives Matters alone by, by, by queer women, queer women of color, some of which are which Black queer women, right? Who right. I would say in the spirit of Dr. Cannon, um, this is womanist work, right? Um, um, I mean, so, I mean, I could, th I, to me, there's so many, but I think yeah. what it does is it involves yeah. dislodging the idea from from one iteration. And that one iteration is what we kind of understand to take place within the Black Academy, Black, Black, theolo uh, Black theological womanism, right? That is womanist theology and ethics as written, you know, the work of Black women scholars. And that's very important. But I would argue that's one right. iteration, right? Right. Um, right? There are many right. different ways to see how the womanist idea has been taken up in the world by other women or to describe it as such um 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 you know that 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 makes sense so i know for time that's i'll probably stop there but it, it's it's so yeah. alive it's so well especially in the clergy environment but certainly in other advocacy environments yeah yeah no, i love that i love that thank you uh so we, we have a few minutes we have about three minutes left uh, what would you leave us with? If there were a, a takeaway or two from your text that you would hope that we would carry on and, and that you would hope um, would, would, would live outside of this 60 minutes that we spent together today, what would it be? I think for Native daughters and sons to testify. And I recognize that um, for some, that is something that is not as threatening as others, right? Yes. For example, what does it mean to testify as a right. tenure track faculty member when your livelihood is at stake? What right. does it mean to testify as a black student when potentially you could have a, a white professor or a, you know, another professor grade you precisely for the truth you speak? So, so I recognize, but, but, but what I wanna encourage native daughters and sons is um, to find spaces um, where there can be collective moments of, of telling that tr telling the truth as you see it, even if that is first to each other. Yes, at yes. Native sons, because there's yes. something valuable in and of itself, and being able to speak a truth. This goes back to testimony service. Right. Being able to speak a truth that is being denied by broader culture, right. and in that space to be affirmed by others. Who, right. who know that truth to be the truth, right? To, to be, be real. Yeah, um, and to so, real. To, to you know, we need more accounts of people testifying in theological education yes. um, to, 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 to diagnose where we are and where we need to go. Um, to faculty, uh, particularly non-Black faculty, and to administrators as well, non-Black faculty. And notice I said non-Black. I'm just mm -hmm. not addressing myself to white. <laughs> but right. also non-Black, right? right? Who I think in many ways can participate in structures of anti-Blackness within Absolutely. the academy. Um, to um, truly take seriously um, this mode of testimony as a, as a real form of knowledge about what is going wrong, mm -hmm. about what mm -hmm. potentially needs to happen. Mm -hmm. um, but, but what I also recognize is that, is that means uh, 
a profound relinquishing of privilege. Um, and so, 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 really, so really, I think the request is less to participate in deep listening. That feels so like benign, so mm -hmm, kind of, mm -hmm. you know, uh, uh, yep. easy, but rather what it means to grapple uh, non-Black faculty and administrators and structures, one's privilege that makes testifying so dangerous mm. for Native dogs. And, and asking the question, it's not just about um, it's not just about uh, 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 fulfilling quotas or requirements um, that reflects uh, diversity, um, but it's rather doing the hard work of asking how structures within your institution are, are either enabling right. flourishing, Black flourishing, or dis and disabled or disallowing right. Black right. flourishing, right? right. Um, and so right. for me, the all that I write about is right. towards these two goals, right? right. Of uh, that that allows Native daughters and sons to testify, but really, really is 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 asking, not really asking, demanding that yeah. administrate non-black administrators and faculty uh, faculty members become accountable for now, how reg they're regardless their regardless of of what you're saying, right? Like regardless mm -hmm. of the language, because there's a whole lot of you know. There's a whole lot of liberal white speak. Right? That's right. They'd be like, all oh, right. the week, you know, we're doing this, that's this, right. and this, and I need that's to be right. grateful. Right. That, that's, that's, that's happening. Right. That's happening that's everywhere. Right. It right? It so, is. so it, it, part of what I'm hearing you're, you're calling us to is an analysis of complicity in the structure. That's right. Regardless of, of, of how, you know, that's right. Good or white folk you think you are. That's right. That's right. Regardless of the right? fact that regardless. regardless of the fact that we have increasing diversity numbers in, in student population, regardless right. of the fact that we have our first two tenured African American right. one fact, regardless, right? Because because what what is being spoken by uh, black faculty by black students suggests another narrative that Suggest that in no fact ways. that in fact you know, racial justice has not been achieved, that in fact, we are not moving towards a colorblind or a more equitable arrangement more equitable. that's still wow. white dominance. It's in equalities and inequities are still deeply entrenched in the structures of theological education. Deeply implicated, deeply implicated. Wow, um, that, that's our time. Uh, my goodness, uh, Dr. Day, thank you so much for, yes, uh, for, for being here, for sharing. You know, from sharing of, of your text, from sharing of yourself, right? Like we understand this, this is this is a, a a work from your heart, so we're we're grateful for that on behalf of the CER, and certainly certainly on behalf of the CBE. I mean, Garrett Evangelical, thank you so much. Uh, you're you're doing a good work, and it's one that all of our institutions need. Mm, thank you so much, Tarina. It's been wonderful, and I'm so grateful I was able to be with the community.